I'm Chris. I'm a tall, narrow farmer, and that's pretty much all that matters uh, for our purposes here. Um, I'm also a member of the Chopco Band of Piscataway Indians, who are the ancestral caretakers of this place. So, Laura doesn't know this, but when we had a conversation a little while ago about um, me doing a land acknowledgement, I was on my cell phone, and when she said, you're going to do the land acknowledgement, I put my phone on mute, and I just kind of went. <laughs> um, and then I calmed down. Because I'm an adult, I have children, I have to be calm. Um, a land acknowledgement can go a lot of ways. Um, it's, a, it's kind of a fraught issue for indigenous people because it can be tempting to do the cathartic thing and just stand up on the tallest thing you can find and go, that land's stolen, that's stolen, that one's stolen, that's also stolen. But that doesn't really help a lot when it comes to a nuanced and detailed and uh, sensitive discussion of conservation and what that means. And conservation has a pretty interesting history. Um, my dad, who a lot of people in this room know, uh, Rico Newman, basically says conservation was the beginning of white guilt. Um, as, uh, as colonial forces kind of moved west and realized what was happening to the land as they occupied it and began to farm it and develop it or extract from it, they kind of realized that eventually we are going to run out of land and it would be a real, real shame if uh, certain areas weren't protected. And uh, like a lot of white guilt, it, uh, it was kind of poorly conceived, and sometimes the solutions were clumsily executed. Um, conservation really kind of began almost in the George Catlin kind of model of, let's set this area aside, and let's let the Indians there be Indians and not assimilate them, and not you know, civilize them, and leave them there with the mountains, and the flora, and the fauna, and let them exist in this kind of racist Jurassic Park, where you kind of have Shoshones instead of Velociraptors. And it's just this kind of really weird idea of keeping these people frozen in time so they can kind of be gawked at by audiences. But over time, that kind of gave way to more of a John Muir kind of model that's more familiar to people today, where it needs to be wilderness. It needs to be free of people. And the problem with that is that indigenous people were there. And so for there to be wildland wilderness and these green spaces and open spaces to be conserved, they first had to be created. And to be created, they had to be depopulated. And that was done deliberately, by force, with blood. It was not just a thing where we kind of conveniently disappeared. We were forced off. When you look at places like the Sierras, you look at Glacier, Yellowstone, Grand Canyon, these were all places that were occupied at the time they were formed. They were not empty. They were not these Edenic wonderlands where people had never been since the time that God did this and supposedly created them. These were people's homes and had been for centuries, millennia, forever, as far as some of these tribes' cultural traditions are concerned. So because of that, you have, you have this kind of, uh, you have two ways of looking at conservation depending on where you come from culturally. For us, you know, in kind of the flattened American culture, Conservation almost represents the best of America. It represents self-restraint and getting away from, or at least calming down that impulse to develop and extract and turn a profit from something or create wealth from something, you know, private wealth or even public wealth from something. It's, you know, it, it, it seems like it's a really good idea to seal a place off and protect it. But for a native person looking at a place like Piscataway Park, or you know, people out west, the Crow, the Shoshone, all the people that were displaced from the most famous places in the country, it looks a lot different. When you were displaced from your homeland, and then somebody seals it off and says, we're going to protect this, but also you're not allowed. Because the key idea of wilderness is that you don't, nobody lives there, including the original inhabitants who created it. Um, so that's, that's part of the fraughtness of discussions around conservation and what land is and what it means to people and what it means for a place to be protected. The idea that places need to be minimally disturbed and not bothered versus native people who say these landscapes did not just grow up by themselves. We were an integrated part of it. We were the ones that, you know, these places are anthropogenic in nature even if you don't see it. 
know, they were influenced by native people, by their hands, by fire, by wildlife that we directed in certain places, by certain cultivars that we encouraged to grow in certain places for a reason. Um, so conservation means different things to different people. And where we are now <clears throat> is in a place where finally we're starting to appreciate that perspective. And by we, I mean this room, frankly, there's mostly full of white people. I didn't think I'd see something like this in my lifetime. I'm a pretty young man, and I'm an optimist, but frankly, I'm surprised by where we are and encouraged by it, that we're having this conversation openly and respectfully, and that people are actually interested and willing to fill up a room and talk about it. Um, so with that, I'm going to keep these remarks brief, so we have lots of time for questions and discomfort. Um, <laughs> but um, I do want to thank, um, I want to thank Laura, I want to thank Wilton, and everybody else who's been involved in putting this together. Um, because when I say this is unexpected and kind of a brave thing to do, it is. It was a pretty brave thing for you, knowing me and the things that I say, to hand me a mic and say, and just kind of step back, because I could have said anything. <laughs> um, but more than that, I also want to thank the people who are not here. Um, my ancestors, the original and best caretakers of this place. And to thank them for having it here for us and for hanging on long enough to put me in this place today. Because it wasn't easy for any of them. And uh, with that, I'm just going to say I hope we do you proud. One issue to everyone for coming. And I hope we have a productive session. Who cool, am I introducing next? Shania. Thank you, Chris, for that very enlightening introduction, and welcome to Piscataway Park. Good afternoon. Welcome to this afternoon's discussion of Conservation, a Complicated History. I am Shamika Berry, the Interpretation Coordinator here at the Akakeek Foundation, and I will serve as your MC today. Many of our ancestors survived the unimaginable. As a historical interpreter, it is my responsibility to honor their voices by telling their stories. This series is designed to honor the voices of those who were here on this land before us and those who still live here. Today is a day of learning and sharing respectfully and compassionately. We have a wonderful moderator who will guide our discussions and there will be time after the reception for deeper conversations. I would now like to introduce our foundation president and CEO, Ms. Laura Ford. Hi everyone, and thank you, Shamika. And I want to take advantage of the moment before we get started to say thank you to the staff for everything. As you look around this room and see the people in this room, it's not, it's not me. I don't deserve the appreciation for pulling this together and sort of standing in a long line and on the shoulders of people who um, put things in motion for us to be in a different place. So thank you to the staff for everything that you all have done. Um, so most of you know I'm new to this role, but I'm not new to the foundation and I'm not new to the Scatterway Park. Um, I started here about 15 years ago and had the opportunity to work with both Fulton Parker and Anna <coughs> Hayes, and I think um, there are so many people who love Piscataway Park and who really care about what happens here. And all of those people, including the people in this room that I've worked alongside in the community um, for years, uh, have moved us to this place where we're having this conversation. This landscape tells a story of generations of change. Our tagline used to be, and it still, it still speaks to me, land shaping people, people shaping the land over time. That's really the unique story that we have to tell here. This land was saved from development in the 1950s to preserve the view from George Washington's Mount Vernon across the Potomac River. And Piscataway Park was the first park created to uh, preserve a historic vista. And so the significance of this landscape as a historic vista and that process is something that we'll talk about today, but it's only part of the story. And I think that as we look at what preserving the view also did, it preserved the heart of the traditional homeland of the Piscataway people. 
It preserved a landscape that carries the stories of first contact and colonization and the evolution of agriculture in this region against the backdrop of slavery, emancipation, Jim Crow, the civil rights movement, and the American Indian movement. And I'm nervous. We at the foundation realize that this is a complicated conversation to have. Um, these discussions about our history and our future are not easy. Um, so we've included guidance in the program on the second page that really um, describes how to participate in the conversation today. And I want to point out it's how to be a good participant. And this comes directly, almost word for word, from our Eco Explorers program that we provide for students who come here to experience the National Colonial Farm. Um, the guidance is designed to encourage dialogue that's respectful and accountable and that's compassionate and, and honest um, so that we can arrive at different understandings of each other and the world. And so this is something we do in all of our programming here and um, I look forward to the discussion today about it. And it's really this enhanced understanding, the sharing of collective wisdom and experience, the opportunity to connect deeply and meaningfully with one another that we want to cultivate here. It's what's driving our interpretive planning process, and that's what's going to get us to a place where we're telling a different story, a more authentic story of this landscape, one that welcomes all the visitors and helps us to connect to one another and to the land. So thanks for being here today. I look forward to the conversation, and I'd like to introduce the Foundation's board chair, Dr. Virginia Busby. Uh, for those who don't know Virginia, she's an archaeologist who has expertise in historic preservation, land conservation, and cultural resource management. She served on the Maryland Commission on Indian Affairs, and she has experience coordinating the types of complicated conservation and preservation strategies for indigenous cultural landscapes that we'll be talking about today. She's amazing. And we're very fortunate to have her on the board at this time. Virginia? Thanks, Laura. I won't take long. I won't take long, but it's important to, uh, as a board to acknowledge and be fully, fully participating in what we're doing here today. So first, welcome on behalf of the board. Thank you for being here with us. I'd like to thank our guests and our moderator. And I'd like to thank our, our staff who's dedicated to making this a really productive process. So um, the board is fully supportive of the conversations and questions that this series is meant to address and the engagement with everybody. We're looking forward to the respectful dialogue and we're looking forward to also being in an uncomfortable position that these discussions and considerations might bring about. But we're fully supportive and looking forward to the dynamic conversations and the rest of these series. This is the first of three, and we're looking forward to you joining us and bringing others to help us with the rest of the series of probing what we need to do to move forward in our interpretation. So Laura referenced, and, and Chris has too, the, the creation of the park and the conservation work that went into how Piscataway Park as a national park was created. Um, it's, it is a complicated and, and complex story. And things were conserved or preserved or put into public land ownership and a view shed was protected, which we can probe what that might mean. Many other things took place with the creation of the National Park and the curation of that view shed. And the foundation now wants to be purposeful and acknowledge the rest of the stories, the rest of the views, the rest of the things that happened with, with the creation of the park and with the full history and the full future of this land. Um, we want to recognize the power in the position where we are, the vantage, the vantages that you can have from coming to experience the interpretation we might offer here at the foundation. We recognize, the word that comes to my mind is we're, we're the nexus. We want to be fully acknowledging what all is feeding and coming from where we are, from this land, from the people, from the history of this land. And we want to honor <coughs> the land, we want to honor the people and the richness uh, of this land and share it. So, 
there's, there's so many important aspects of the land, so many important stories, and we're seeking your input into helping us into which ones, how to tell them, how, how we might do honor to the people and to the land, and we're looking forward to help you helping us move forward in the future. Um, thank you, and I'll hand it back to Shamika now. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Virginia. This first workshop of the Land and River Series is titled Conservation, A Complicated Story because of the complicated history and complex relationships that have shaped our region and continue to influence our interactions with one another and the environment. Speaking today is Dr. Wilton C. Corcoran, a veteran of the United States Navy, 1966 to 1972. After 22 years as President and Chief Executive Officer of the Akakeek Foundation, he retired in 2011. He now serves as Senior Advisor. Mr. Corcoran, Dr. Corcoran has nearly 50 years of experience in education, conservation, and cultural heritage organizations, having previously worked at the Consortium of Universities of the Washington Metropolitan Area, the George Washington University, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. He has also served on numerous boards and commissions, including the Environmental Fund for Maryland, Museum Advisory Panel for the Maryland Historical Trust, <coughs> the Southern Maryland Museum Association, the Maryland Association of, Muse of History Museums, and the Washington Regional Association of Grant Makers. In addition to Dr. Corcoran, who will also serve as a panelist, our other panelists for today is Silvanaco Farms co-founder, Chris Newman. He is a permaculturalist and an outspoken evangelist of ecological, economic, and social sustainability in food. A member of the Choptico Band of Piscataway Indians, Chris places a heavy emphasis on the indigenous ethics, values, and knowledge, serving as the often unacknowledged foundation of the modern permaculture movement and the decolonized worldview necessary to ensure the sustainable stewardship of the natural resources. An engineer and techno technologist by trade, he also accepts and explores the potential of modern scientific innovation to address the gaps left by ecosystem farming and solving a sustainability problem wherein timeliness is a factor. Our moderator for today is Dr. Julie A. King, a 30 years experience, who has his 30 years experience studying, writing, and teaching about historical archaeology and Chesapeake history and culture. From 2003 to 2011, Dr. King served as the expert member on the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, a federal agency that advises the President and Congress on matters of national historic preservation policy. Her book, Archaeology, Narrative, and the Politics of the Past, The View from Southern Maryland, received a book award from the American Association of State and Local History in 2013. She has graciously agreed to be our moderator for this entire series. I will now ask Dr. Corbin to come up for his presentation and immediately following, Dr. King will come up with the panelists and our discussion will begin. Thank you so much, Anika. This is a, a very humbling audience because I see a lot of people who know this story much better than I do. And uh, I'm coming at it from the perspective, I guess, of a historian and an anthropologist, a, a kind of participant observer in part of this story. It's interesting that Chris set the stage with the definitions of conservation in the 19th century. And then in the 20th century, it again evolved to be growing trees so that you could cut them down and grow them again. And uh, so uh, it's changed a lot of different times. But beginning, oh, I better put my glasses on so I don't get to rambling. But beginning in the 1950s and 60s, a small group of women and men, and this is the March 31st, Women's History Month. Right here in Akakeek, changed the way Americans would think about land conservation again. 
for at least the next two generations. They also protected this important place from private development so that it remains accessible to all people today. I'll start in September 1955 when a woman named Frances triggered a series of events here in Akakeek that led to the creation of a new kind of national park. This particular woman worked on Capitol Hill. Her name was Frances. But not Frances Bolton, who those of you who know this story uh, probably think I'm talking about. The person I'm talking about is Frances Donahue. She worked in the office of an Oklahoma congressman. And she also worked part-time as a stringer for a couple of local newspapers. And she lived in Akakeek. So on September 15, 1955, Francis Donahue broke this story in the Prince George's Inquirer Gazette. Let me be sure I go in the right direction. Uh, that the that Ohio Congresswoman Frances Bolton had secretly bought the Bliss Farm, this farm in Akakee. The following day, stories ran in the Washington Evening Star and Baltimore Sun, and so the farm had already been bought, but the action was just starting. And here I need to back up just a little bit to introduce some of the people who became characters in this story. Alice and Henry Ferguson bought a farm here in the 1920s. It happened to be a particularly important site for Piscataway Indians, but I think they bought it for the view. I'm not sure. I've got to be sure I'm going in the right direction. There we go. The Fergusons soon discovered that the old farmhouse was beyond restoration. So Alice designed and built a new house to stand in the same spot. She filled it with an eclectic assortment of antiques and comfortable furnishings and decorated it with paintings, many of them her own. Throughout the 1930s, they entertained any number of Washington socialites and new dealers, especially young artists and left-leaning intellectuals. Mrs. Ferguson actually built a second house so that some of them could live in Akakeek and commute to their jobs in Washington. And that group included Robert Ware Strauss, a community organizer and publicist who worked in the executive office of president at the time, sculptor Lenore Thomas, no, that's not a sculptor. <laughs> uh, Charles Wagner, architect Charles Wagner, sculptor Lenore Thomas, uh, anti-poverty activist Sally Ring, and others that I don't have pictures of. Then came World War II and this group scattered. And at war's end, Bob Strauss returned to Akakeek and re reconnected with as many of the old group as he could. He married Lenore, and somehow they persuaded celebrity architect Charles Goodman to design their house, which they built right next to the Ferguson place. Hmm? Yeah, that's the Wagner house. Oh, I've got the slides back with me. Uh, you'll see the Strauss house in a little bit. Uh, I'm sorry. Soon, Bob put a contract on a large chunk of land just across Brian Point Road from the Hard Bargain Farm. It turns out he couldn't afford it, so he persuaded the Fergusons to buy it instead. But his intent was to subdivide the property and sell it to like-minded returning veterans. Every purchaser would have to buy at least five acres and had to agree to a series of restricted covenants, but not the racial covenants that were common at the time. These covenants limited subdivision and tree cutting and prohibited commercial establishments. The idea was to create a community in nature. And the scheme actually did work. Charles Wagner and his journalist wife, Nancy, bought the first parcel. Charles designed a house, which you already saw. This is the Strauss house. No. That's not it either? No. All right, well, I apologize for that. I'm cutting and pasting these uh, slides, and so the Strauss house must be something that's not in here. That's too bad. I apologize that's, for that. Uh, my mother is sculptor. But, but yeah, that, I know that's a that's a sculptor. Sculpture, sculpture. 
I'll have Langer Okay. So this is the Langer House as well. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, right. okay. So I just somehow I switched out that other slide. I, I had a slide of it, but I don't have it now. Anyway, they moved in on the 4th of July, 1947. Others followed, and by 1955, where I started this story, there were at least 50, 30 property owners, a community association, a collectively owned real estate company, and a nonprofit foundation named for the recently deceased Alice Ferguson to support community improvement and education. These folks mostly built their own houses, many of them designed by Charles Wagner in the wood and glass style of mid-century modern, which you've seen one example twice already of. The houses, by the way, are now designated a historic district in Prince George's County. You know all that already. They built their own roads, they started their own water company, and they built their swimming pool. They called the community the Moyon Reserve, appropriating the name of the Piscataway capital that Captain John Smith had reported visiting in 1608. Things uh, were going pretty well. Um, I don't know if this scene actually happened, but interesting painting. But they were concerned about this large farm at the end of Brian Point Road, which was owned by an absentee investor. Several thought their community real estate company ought to buy it, but it didn't have the money. And then, in the spring of 1955, they learned that it was in immediate danger of being developed. So they turned to Mount Vernon for help. Turns out that Mount Vernon was keenly interested in the Bliss Farm, too. It was right smack in the middle of the view from the South Portico. This is what it looked like in 1955, and here's what the folks in Akakik imagined it would look like if something wasn't done to protect it. The group designated Charles Wagner to make the call, which he did. Cecil Wall, the resident director of Mount Vernon, had already attempted unsuccessfully to get the regents, the equivalent of a board at Mount Vernon, interested in doing something about it, He'd also tried unsuccessfully to interest the National Park Service. So alarmed and knowing that action by the Regents or anybody else was unlikely, he responded to Charlie Wagner's call by going around the board and writing directly to the Vice Regent he thought and could and would do something about it, Congresswoman Bolton. He wrote about her, he wrote about her, about the news he received from Charles Wagner to the effect that the land was about to become a high-end waterfront residential development. It was stated, he wrote, that there might be a communal club and to placate Mount Vernon, the clubhouse would take the form of a replica of Mount Vernon. <laughs> Mrs. Bolton acted immediately. First, she tried to convince John D. Rockefeller to buy it, and that didn't work. She turned again to the National Park Service, and there she got the same runaround Cecil Wall had been getting for two years. They didn't have the money. The farm wasn't significant in any way that made the Park Service be interested. And even if it were, it would take years to get Congress to authorize a new park. So she bought the farm herself. Her representatives negotiated quietly with the property owner over the summer, and on August 4th, 1955, Mrs. Bolton's lawyer signed a contract to buy the farm. We know all that now, but apparently the deal was supposed to be hush-hush at the time. I'm not sure why, but Mrs. Bolton didn't want the word to get out. And that's where Frances Donahue comes in. As I said, she broke the news on September 15th. And Bob Strauss later wrote in his memoir, The Possible Dream, our little group first learned of the sale from local newspapers. Naturally, we became intensely curious, he continued. And he neglected to mention that Francis Donahue's name, he mentioned, neglected to mention her name in his memoir. And I asked her later why she thought that was. And she told me that Bob grilled her trying to get her source, but she refused to tell him and that didn't please him. So she thinks he left her name out because of that. And by the way, she thought that. 
Anyway, by the way, she died in 2010 without ever revealing her source, as far as I know. But she did get the story. This time, Bob Strauss was the one deputized <coughs> to write on behalf of the local community, asking for an opportunity to talk uh, with Mrs. Bolton. Then, as he recalled in his memoir, he followed up with a phone call, and he wrote, to my pleasure and relief, she replied, can you come next week? A week later, I caught a plane for Cleveland, carrying the batons of the Moyon, the Scataway Company, the Alice Ferguson Foundation, the Citizens Association, the PTA, whatever else. He pitched an expansive preservation project, and she was receptive. He reported that she agreed on the spot that the whole six-mile stretch of riverfront from the Scataway Bay through Marshall Hall ought to be protected. It was the beginning of a beautiful relationship. Over the next 20 years, these two people, this refined conservative Republican congresswoman and the outspoken left-wing spin doctor worked hand in glove in the protection of this landscape. They were the faces of the effort that included many, many more people here and elsewhere. The following spring, Mr. Bolton brought several of the Mount Vernon ladies across the river on a yacht. They toured the Bolton property and then met with community members at Hard Bargain Farm, where Henry Ferguson entertained and charmed his guests. And again, Bob Strauss recalled, it was a very genial party at which cookies, tea, and scotch were consumed in fairly equal <laughs> amounts. Together, they began immediately to work on several fronts. They continued to press the Department of the Interior to establish a national park. Rosamund Byrne, who was then Vice, President, Vice Regent for Maryland, hosted the Prince George's County Commissioners and other public officials at Mount Vernon and urged them to establish zoning laws that would protect the view. They brought in city planner and large landscape visionary Frederick Gutheim to develop a plan for the property. He recommended they build on the foundation already in existence with the Moyon Reserve and create a working landscape rather than a static park. He suggested a new organization be set up that could get to integrate the public and private conservation interests. And so on August 18, April 18, 1957, the Aptitude Foundation was born. Mrs. Bolton donated her property to the new foundation and was elected its president. She appointed Robert Ware Strauss general manager. And while they continued to work on additional land protections, they also began to develop a program for the new foundation to carry out. On 19, in 1958, they decided to establish an agricultural historical museum to preserve and perpetuate a living and productive landscape similar to what was here in the Washington's time. And with bravado, they called it the National Colonial Farm, presumably to take its place alongside the National Zoo, the National Arboretum, the National Gallery of Art, and so on and so forth. In addition to Fritz Guggenheim, they brought in prominent conservationists and preservationists to serve on the new Board of Trustees. They brought in Wilbur Harvey Hunter, the director of the oldest museum in America, the Peel Museum in Baltimore, to develop a plan for the new farm, which would grow heirloom crops and heritage breeds of livestock. <coughs> Interestingly, one of Dr. Hunter's suggestions was that the farm grow the strain of tobacco commercially grown in colonial America and then create their own brand of cigarettes to sell as a revenue source for the organization. One of the heirloom crops the farm still grows, Orinoco tobacco, is the strain that John Rolfe brought from Venezuela in 1609, but the idea about the cigarettes never seems to have gotten off the ground. Just as it seemed things were pretty set, the Washington Suburban Sanitary Commission announced a plan to build a sewage treatment plant on the shoreline. In a move reminiscent of the earlier developer, WSSC said that they might build a sewage treatment plant as a replica of Mount Vernon. 
<laughs> and uh, everybody here would be powerless to resist because WSSC had the right of eminent domain. There ensued a year-long pitch battle that ultimately led to the creation of the Scataway National Park. The activists here in Africa and at Mount Vernon swung into action. They stepped up the efforts on the hill to create a national park. They created a media blitz. They organized public meetings and press conferences and placed many, many newspaper articles and editorials. From Washington to Baltimore to Richmond, public opinion throughout the region mobilized on behalf of the Mount Vernon view. Still, the WSSC insisted on moving forward, so in the summer of 1961, just as the condemnation process was beginning, the Akakeek Foundation purchased a 150-acre parcel in the path of the development of the sewage treatment plant and donated it to the federal government. And that gave the feds legal standing to block the construction until the legislation created the park could pass. <clears throat> Here for the first time, the Mount Vernon ladies themselves fully joined the effort. They wrote letters and gave interviews on the subject and press coverage appeared across the country. This headline from the Chicago Tribune, where is it? Yeah, this one, <laughs> always makes me smile. <laughs> but when the Mount Vernon ladies got aroused, things did start to happen. Articles and editorials appeared in Des Moines, St. Paul, Santa Barbara, Savannah, Charleston, Milwaukee, and Providence, just to name a few. The letters, calls, visits, and media pressure had their desired effect, and that fall, Congress authorized the Scataway Park. President Kennedy signed the bill in October, in October 1961. Uh, the Akaki Foundation eventually acquired additional parcels and then negotiated a deal with the National Park Service <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to donate all its land to the government in exchange for the right to continue to operate its programs here. And also signed a cooperative agreement with the Interior Department, which actually created the park and by the donation of land gave it substance. It was a new kind of natural park. This legislation creating Piscataway Park authorized for the first time on a large scale the use of easements, which allowed for most of the land inside the official boundaries of the park to remain in private residential use and still be protected in perpetuity against any adverse development. They brought in the brilliant tax lawyer, Carolyn Dager Fortas, to create easements that mirrored the local covenants already in place. And they allowed landowners, the, the uh, easements allowed landowners to donate the development rights on their property to the National Park Service while retaining ownership of other rights. Most of you know all this stuff. In 1965, two local activists, Delvin Jensen and Dixie Otis, lobbied the Maryland legislature to authorize local jurisdictions to grant property tax credits in exchange for donating senior easements. And just uh, for who these folks are, um, from left to right, Delegate Ray McDonough, Senator Gilbert Goody, National Park Service Director George Hartzell, State Senator Fred Wineland, and State Senator John Thomas Perrin with uh, Belva Jensen and Dixie Otis in the middle line. The Internal Revenue Service subsequently issued a precedent setting ruling that the value of the conservation easement donations could also be deducted from federal income tax. <clears throat> in 1967, Prince George's County became the first local jurisdiction in the United States to grant property tax credits for easement donations. All this established a pattern that's been replicated in thousands of places nationwide over the past five decades. These uh, citizen lobbyists set the precedent that enabled the conservation easement to become what I think is the preeminent tool for private land conservation in the United States today. 
another movement within the conservation definition. Although some opposition remained, most local stakeholders, I believe, supported the park. They included uh, Piscataway Ch Chief Turkey Tayak, who requested that in order to acknowledge the on ongoing connection to the Piscataway people to the land, that he be buried when he died with his ancestors in the sacred ground near the mouth of the Bakke Creek. By the beginning of 1968, a sufficient number of local East residents had donated easements for the Park Service's large to declare that the park was substantially complete. And on Washington's birthday of that year, the Scataway Park was formally dedicated in a ceremony here at Bryan Point. And again, uh, from left to right, our Mrs. Bulletin, Chief Turkey Tyre, Velva Jensen, Bob Strauss, Rosamond Byrne, County Commissioner Gladys Bellman, and Congressman Herbie Machen. In 1975, the Scataway Park was put on the National Register of Historic Places, both because of its precedent-setting place in the history of land conservation and because of the numerous Native American sites that are here. In the 1980s, the Akakee Foundation began to pioneer in a field of sustainable agriculture, led by the work of more influential women, and again, some men. They included philanthropist Jean Wallace Douglas, agricultural economist Mary Lee, organic cattle farmer Martha Holdridge, and environmental economist John Cumberland. In 1989, 20 years before Michelle Obama planted an organic garden at the White House, the Akakeet Foundation decided to establish the ecosystem farm to be a laboratory for organic and sustainable agriculture in this region. I joined the foundation in 1989, after that decision was made, and I had the opportunity to work with many of the earliest participants in this story, including Robert Ware Strauss, Nancy and Charles Wagner, Belva Jensen, Dixie Otis, Martha Mills, Clara and Bill Moran, and many, many others, and many of you here in the audience. During the 1990s, Mervyn Savoy became the first Piscataway person to serve on the Foundation's Board of Trustees. Rahul McQuander and Louise Webb, both of whom have deep roots in the local African-American community, also joined the board about that time. They led efforts to improve and diversify the foundation's interpretation, but change was difficult, which is why we're still working on it today. On the land conservation front, Vivian Mills, a longtime community activist and supporter of the foundation, joined our staff in 2007 to revitalize that part of our work at a time when development pressure was once again increasing in the area. Today, the Scataway Park encompasses some 5,000 acres. The federal government owns about 1,000 acres along the shoreline, and the remainder is permanently in private hands. The public's interests, namely the scenic value, the biological diversity, and the Native American sites are protected through the conservation easements and the park regulations. The integrity of the view is maintained by the landowners themselves, and the easements are enforced by the National Park Service. Despite what some people thought in the 1950s, there are many reasons this landscape is significant. But there are many stories to tell on this landscape. I've told you just a little part of one of those stories, maybe the one that's best known to most people, but not the most significant. And as we begin to explore some of the other stories in this series, I look forward to learning much, much more. Thank you.
I apologize about that slide. I want to open it up. I think that uh, National Colonial Farm and Akakeek Foundation wants to open it up for uh, to the audience. Um, I, <coughs> excuse me, uh, took my cue from the Good. material that had been provided ahead of time, and the, one of the themes of this, um, which you so uh, perfectly introduced, was the idea of the view shed. But there's also this whole notion of um, a complicated history and the idea that things are grounded in race. And I was going to ask a question that would have allowed um, uh, Mr. Corkin to talk about what he talked about. So I have three questions instead of four. And I'm going to start off with uh, the first one. And, um, and, and I know uh, that this might seem, my students like to call me a hater. Um, because they're always like, why are you looking at things at glasses half empty? And, uh, but I think it's important to, uh, you know, we just heard a great story um, when a few people get together. I think it was Margaret Mead who said, you know, the, uh, the only thing that's ever changed the world is a group of really, co a small group of committed people. Robert Boyer Strauss was related to her. Was he? <laughs> so, Isn't that right here? So, yeah, that's very positive. So I, and, and I was been recently doing this project with uh, the National Park Service on Piscataway Park, and one of the things um, that we're doing is that was called ethnographic overview and assessment. So we've done a lot of talking with people, some oral histories, and the view shed comes up regularly. So I wanted to ask about the view shed, um, because I think ultimately that the view shed is kind of grounded in race, or at least we could understand it too big. And that, the, that this park was created uh, to protect Mount Vernon. We've heard that. And so this park, this landscape, is in the gaze of Mount Vernon. Um, we, this landscape is to be consumed by people at Mount Vernon who may never even come here and realize that it has its deep, uh, history. So I guess my question, and maybe I'll start with uh, uh, by posing it to Chris and then um, to Will, is, um, is there a way we can turn that gaze around where we reflect back on, we take Mount Vernon into our view shed? Um, from, a, from a native perspective, I mean, I'll be perfectly frank, we don't care about George Washington or Mount Vernon. I mean, I'll just be blunt. Don't, don't care about his view shed, don't care about his house, don't care about any of it. It's all native land. And I think one of the difficult things about and you know some of the trouble that I have, you know, I'm not going to say trouble with with in this mission because it, it had to start somewhere. Otherwise, this place would who knows be a theme park or a you know, sewage treatment plant or whatever. Um, but it, you know, George Washington was known to the Six Nations and his family as a burner of villages. This was a guy who starved women and children by burning their food. And it's difficult for us to to have that in consideration at all. Um, you know, it's, for Native people in this place, it's not about looking across the river. It's about what's in the river. It's about what's in the land. It's about the bodies that are buried here. It's about the soil being made out of the blood and bones of our ancestors that, that have been here forever. You know, our people are the land and the land is the people. Um, looking at it from, from the perspective of George Washington or even trying to spin it around where people maybe appreciate Mount Vernon from, from this area is, it still centers the colonial story. Um, you know, Akakik, for me, for the people I know and the people I grew up with, is about this place and just this place. Um, you know, the people across the river weren't our people. You know, even before George Washington, still weren't our people. Um, we were, as close as we were together, you know, it's, if, you know, you tell somebody from Queens and somebody from Brooklyn that they're basically the same person, they'll kill you. And it's kind of the same with Native people. We might have been right across the river from each other, but the cultures were extremely distinct. Um, so, you know, for, 
for us, um, it, it's more, you know, let's, let's talk about this place now and, and how it came to be, irrespective of the colonial history. Um, you know, we, we talk about national colonial harm, um, and you know, you think about what language means to people. Those are three words that are just intrinsically hostile to indigenous people. National, you know, whose nation? It was a nation created on top of hundreds of nations that were already here and had been thriving, you know, practically forever. Colonial, you know, was the instrument of our dispossession. Farm was another instrument of dispossession. You look at African American people, because I, I'm half, so it's kind of like you get a double whammy. For, for African Americans, the farm is a place of bondage and difficulty and a complete lack of freedom and independence. And on the other hand, for for Native people, farm is an instrument of surrender. You came to the farm because you weren't out there, you know, in the wilderness anymore, the quote unquote wilderness, you know, burning, burning the landscapes, cultivating the landscapes in an extensive way that was our way, that was our way of, of dealing and interacting with the landscape in a sustainable way. Um, so I think, you know, when, when we're gonna, if we, if we wanna talk about reframing the, the dialogue and how we look at Akiki, whether it's Mount Vernon looking across the, to the uh, to the view shed that's here, or us maybe looking back, um, you know, looking back across the river, I think we need to step back even further and see what this place was to to the original inhabitants and the people who are still here who view it the same way our ancestors did. Okay, thank you. Well, you wanna... I'm not sure I have anything constructive to add to that. Um, what popped into my mind is uh, uh, Maryland Senate President Mike Miller, <clears throat> who's always been supportive of the Ferguson Foundation and the Advocate Foundation, um, has never in my experience missed an opportunity to tell Mel Vernon that we got to look at them all the time and they better contribute to this effort as well. But it's just, I, I don't. And the reason I thought of this question, I've been thinking of it because I've read Colin Cow Calloway's uh, recent book on uh, George Washington and Native people, and it just, and then this morning, I don't think they've had a chance to look at the Washington Post, but there was an article about a lynching in Woodsville, Virginia, and if you haven't had a chance to read it, you should, um, and about taking to account, and it, uh, it seems to me that um, that, that is, uh, that there's a lot of taking into, a, uh, taking to account that, uh, might be done. If you haven't had a chance to look at Colin Cowboy's book um, on uh, George Washington, you should you should do it. I want to turn the question now to the audience. Um, is there anybody that has comments about that question or your own questions? Um, my name is Jim Roberts. I'm the board of the uh, Faculty Foundation. I think. I think we're not going to achieve winners and losers in this dialogue because it's, it's bigger than us. It's, 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 it's as big as our nation and the nations before us. Um, the way I like to think about it is that uh, we want to listen to the uh, rhythm of the land and the river. And we want to listen to the various layers of the language. And any life of a person or a nation or whatever is like a compost pile. You have this layer, that layer, the next layer, and then something grows on top of that, and then that dies, and then this the next. I think the most important thing is to, to be accurate. And I think where Akaki has an opportunity is to identify a number of those layers that it will interpret. And those, those layers are not necessarily going to agree with each other. I mean, you have the layer before the colonists. Then you have the National Colonial Farm, and, and then you have the conservation movement, and all of those things are 
controversial in one way, or some people like it, some people don't. But I think that's the opportunity that this adequate, which is to do is uh, historically accurate um, interpretation of the several layers. And we're not a resolver of these, these issues. We are a observer and a uh, uh, bringing up of the issues and somebody else got to solve them. So, um, if, if you can go to the mic so that we can capture the audio. <laughs> <laughs> I would really appreciate that. I don't know if people are going to. Very important to capture. I'm Kate Powell. I've lived here 50 years. Donated as an engagement. And um, I'm grateful for this conversation. Uh, we all arrived here at a different time with different amounts of knowledge and awareness of the natives' peoples, of uh, all of the history of the land. And we operate from that base that we've learned in our early years. And I've learned a lot. Um, I was the director of the Alice Ferguson Foundation when Turkey Tayak was buried. And I have to say, I felt like when that legislation was put forward that I was going to be buried <laughs> because <laughs> uh, I wasn't prepared for it. And I didn't have your understanding, Chris, uh, of what had happened. And of course, Alice Ferguson came and discovered the history of the native peoples and did her best to document that, but maybe not in the best way. But she did have turkey kayak at her side for part of that time. And uh, so the only thing I can say is that keeping the conversation going so that we can all rise to another level of understanding is um, really something we should all be grateful for. Could I respond to that just a little bit? Um, so I just kind of wanted to respond to something that Jean said right at the beginning and, um, and a couple of things that you said is, you know, there, there are going to be no winners and losers here. And if we do this, you know, it's, it's too soon to even think about that. Um, in software engineering, we have this concept called technical debt. And technical debt is basically when you do the quickest, easiest thing, basically, to make the client happy or to make the software work, and it's something that eventually is going to bite you, you know, harder than whatever, you know, a little bit of time or pain you save in the short term. And America has a lot of racial debt, has a lot of debt in terms of, you know, interactions with people of, of, of different races and different backgrounds, um, and it's, it's something we've never dealt with. And, you know, the more, the more debt you have, the longer it takes to dig out. And it's, it's one of those things where it's, it might not happen, you know, the solutions, whatever they are, may not happen in my lifetime, may not happen in my kids' lifetime. Um, but the important thing is that at some point you stop dating and you stop taking out the debt. And whether there's winners or losers ever or today, the important thing is that, um, like, like you guys said, the discussion starts. Because that's where you have to start. And it's going to be awkward and clumsy. It's going to be like a middle school band, and nobody's going to know who they really, really want to talk to. Like, do I talk to her? She's talking to her. What's going to happen? Am I going to get embarrassed? Am I going to get yelled at? But that's that's what a lot of it's like. And you know, like you said, with with Alice Ferguson, maybe not doing things you know the perfect way. You know, the truth is, people do the best they can with what they've got <coughs> at the time, and that's all you can ask people. And she did her best at the time, and now we're going to do our best. I've been thinking about climate change, and we're going to be underwater <laughs> in, you know, 50 years. So I think it's really important that we work on all levels, but that we also have to plan for what the future looks like. 
um, I'm on a hill. But I also read an article maybe 10 years ago about how if all the glaciers melt, et cetera, et cetera, that um, the waters will rise 195 feet, okay? So I went and got a jungle map of Makiki, and that happens to be um, the development when you are coming down the 210 and you don't want to go to the light, you want to go around that, there's a development there. And that's where we barely make it above the water level, okay? And what fascinates me, of course, is they probably bulldoze it down. So this is, we've got to figure out some way of integrating the future into the past. We don't want to, with, with the racial um, mix that we're all still coming to grips with, and, and you know, our great grandchildren, if they're still here, will be coming to mix with. But I think, I think this is coming for a very difficult time, so I do think that looking at the layers, the past layers, has to be done delicately <coughs> enough so that people do feel included, and it's not going to be easy. So the win-win is that everybody wins, but it's going to be a very, a very difficult way to get there, because a lot of the money is going to be going towards how do you move. <laughs> Where goes the Alice Ferguson, but that, excuse me, the Aggie Um when the water drops? It just so happened that last night I'm working on this paper about climate change and its impact on archaeological resources. And the Maryland Historical Trust actually has this great interactive map that takes Maryland Department of Natural Resources data and shows you what, that, what the best impact that they can estimate in the next 50 years. So go to the Maryland Historical Trust website and Google climate or search climate change. And, um, and I'm not a software person. I mean, I, I can click. And it came up, and it worked, and I was so excited. And I felt like an IT genius. Um, so <laughs> um, but it, it gives you a sense because, for example, down in St. Mary's County, where I'm from, Point Lookout is gone you know, in 50, in, in 50 years. And, but not every place goes at the same same rate. So it might be, might help you at least get sort of frame it um, better. So are there any other comments about the, the idea of this, this, you know, this, this view shed thing that I, I can't tell you how much I heard it, uh, so much so that I'm going to try to interview one of the regents for our project at um, Vernon to get their perspective because you never really, hear from them. It's like a it's like a, a box. Are there any other comments about that? I can move on to the next question. All right, the next question I have, and so um, and I appreciate your comments about winners and losers. Is anyone in here familiar with Carolyn Finney? Are you familiar with Carolyn Finney? No. Carolyn Finney. Um, she's African American and she wrote a book um, titled Black Faces White Spaces, Reimagining the Relationship of African Americans to the Great Outdoors. And the question that she poses, and she goes on to answer the question in the book, but I'm going to pose it to our, our two panelists. And Chris, you had brought this up earlier when you said uh, predominantly white audience. And you, you've been grappling with this since when you got Mrs. Webb involved in the, in the project. Um, uh, why are African Americans or people of color so underrepresented um, in the interest in nature, outdoor recreation, and environmentalism? Um, to, so, would you like to address first, or you, or? I'll be first last time. <laughs> Unless you really want me to go first. Well, no, it's something. <laughs> um, would, your, why are African Americans not interested not interested. I mean, she poses this question because she really is. She grew up in that kind of household, I guess, that went hiking and all of those kinds of things. And so she tried to explore what the structural reasons were. And I wonder, in your experience here and yours, you know, what 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 do you might what might you identify as reasons that should could well, be addressed? To through quote Mrs. Webb, um, she was never invited. She didn't. She never said she wasn't interested before. But um, I think um, ex subsequent experience 
of mine, and I've learned a lot since I've retired because I've had more time to read and, um, and think about these things. I think it is a matter of, of not feeling welcome in a place, in a movement, um, that just makes a person look elsewhere for their energies. That's a big part of it, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree that there, there's a notion that gets put out there that people of color just aren't interested in nature and that is just categorically false. Um, as long as you can get us out there in a, in a place where we feel like we're not in a white space where we don't belong or might get profiled or you know, otherwise have our physical safety threatened, um, we're happy to be outside. But, you know, black people get the cops called on for doing ordinary things like sleeping in their own dorms and like barbecues in public parks. So it makes us a little bit afraid of, you know, just the amount of stress that's involved in putting yourself in, in, in white spaces like, you know, whether it's a yoga studio or a national park or, you know, it's, you know, people think that the reason we have the health problems we do is because of fried food and soul food. No, it's stress. It's <laughs> having to think constantly about your physical safety. You know, pretty much any woman that's ever had to, you know, hold her keys between her hands like this, going to her car in a dark parking lot, knows what this is like. Like, it's, it's constant. Except if, you know, if, if you're African American and you're a woman, you know, good luck. You know, because you, you've got all the women stuff and all the black stuff all together. Frankly, I don't know how they do it. Um, and that, that's, that's what a lot of it is, um, just when it, when it comes to nature. When it comes to things like farming, which is, I guess, a corollary of that, um, there's something I wrote recently uh, where somebody asked me a similar question, why are African Americans so underrepresented in farming and in agriculture? And the truth is that the arc of progress for black people is supposed to go away from anything resembling a plantation. Um, you know, my grandfather, my mother's, uh, my mother's father was an extremely successful farmer. I mean, and by extremely successful, this is a guy who built his own house in the Great Depression. Built it. White people came from 50 miles away to look at him, pound roofs and pound nails in his roof. They're like, I don't believe it, I don't believe it. Oh my God, it's happening. Um, you know, he was that successful where he was able to vacation, send all of his children to Virginia State University. That successful. But even this guy, as, you know, as much money as he made, as well as he did, as good of a farmer as he was, his kids were not to become farmers. And they didn't. You know, my mother became a lobbyist with the U.S. Postal Service. My uncle went to the Air Force and then worked for the Department of Transportation. You're supposed to get away from the field and sit on your butt and, you know, work a desk job and not have to break your back feeding pigs and, you know, raising spinach and growing corn and cotton and, you know, all these cabbage crops. Um, so there's a, there's, frankly, there's, there's a historic stigma around, you know, farming, around nature that, you know, that we have to deal with. But it's not, it's not from a lack of interest, you know, it's one of those things where, I really wish I could do that, and I really wish that people wouldn't have jokes waiting for me. You know, if you know, if I want to go on a farm, I'm probably going to go on a hike. And I wish I could do this and not have to worry about if I walk by somebody and I look like maybe I don't belong there, that I'm going to have a conversation with the police that could end very poorly. Um, you know, I think I think one of the very small things that Hackett does is. Uh, we partner with the schools, principally African American, and where most of those kids are one, two, three, four generations away from the farm, and they don't know anything about the farm, and they come down and they have a similar experience here, where well, they have a lot of fun on the farm. That doesn't solve a big problem, but it's a, it, it, it's a good thing for them to realize that they're welcome and that. They, they can have fun. Maybe they, after, after they are the lobbyists for the post office, they can have their own farm. Yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things that, that I took away from the ACC is when they did the first cohort, I came in to, to talk to the kids um, you know, kind of on their first day. And, you know, I'm, I'm a farmer. They brought me in because I'm a black farmer. And basically, it's, you know, there's one. Like, it's not impossible. And it's, it's a powerful thing to see yourself reflected anywhere. Um, you know, it's part of the reason why Obama was so important. It was the first time you could actually see that man in that place. And it's really similar with farmers. Like, I come in, and the first thing I do is I ask these kids, all right, who thinks they might want to be a farmer when, they, when, they're, when they're done with high school, they're done with college, and they all kind of 
It's like, I don't want to insult this guy, but hell no, I don't want to be a farmer, and uh, I'm just doing this because I can get paid to be outside. And so there, there's that interest in being outdoors. You know, it's what got them here as opposed to you know, the other opportunities they could have taken. Um, but the most striking thing about, about ACC was when they were done, these kids were saying, when I start my farm. They weren't saying if, they weren't saying I want it, they were saying when, like it freaking happened already. Um, and you know, that was, that was incredible, like that knocked me down. Um, that was incredibly encouraging. Um, so yeah, honestly, I think, you know, it, it is a small program, but it's, it's probably one of the more encouraging things I've seen in agriculture anywhere in the country with regards to getting people of color back involved with, um, with land. Mr. Um, Roberts brings up a good point about how do we bring this, and I'll, I'll get you, how do we bring this locally, you know, to Akaki? I mean, it's a big question that uh, Finney poses on a national level, but you know, and, and your example and your point. Um, sir, you had That's sort of a false narrative in some ways. Um, part of it is that uh, opportunity, um, and if you're talking about urban kids, whether they're white or black, they're limited in getting to so-called nature other than uh, urban parts. Um, but, you know, since well, at the end of World War II, all farmers, white, black, whatever, <coughs> have been leaving the farm, going into the cities, doing all sorts of other things. <coughs> Corporate farms have taken over. You know, I lived in Alabama for a dozen years. There were hundreds of black farmers. Mm -hmm. I mean, and their kids may or may not take over, just like white farmers may or may not have their children take over. So the, it's somewhat of a false narrative to say that if you're a person of color, you don't like nature, it's whether or not you have an opportunity to see it, be able to get there, poverty traps it. But those that who have been able to be invited and go do enjoy it, just like anyone else. Now, you know, anyone who's gone to any of the major national parks over the last 30 years, I can't remember seeing a host of black people at, you know, um, many of the parks out west. You know, it's probably 95% white, and the rest are, uh, if not African Americans, they are people of color from other countries um, who bring up probably the majority. It is really opportunity, um, getting people to do it, but I don't think it's to say that they're not interested. That's my point. It's opportunities and having the money to do it. It isn't cheap, you know, to go out west. You know, if you don't have money, for it, you're living in, you know, in the Bronx or something. Anyway. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why her book is, is good because she does drill down into right. these, some of these things that you talk about. But there still are these uh, unbalanced inequities. Uh, you pointed to some, and uh, you, and so I thought that that would be a question to pose to the audience, since this is important for Akaki to to confront and to move forward with to try to say we're going to break this. You know, we're going to try to break this. So does anybody have? Something that they'd like to contribute this family. Um, yes. Hi, I'm Joy White. I work here as an interpreter. Um, as regards to the question, um, for me, I just maybe a year or two years ago, I finally went back to North Carolina to discover land where my um, family actually owned. We were farmers and I never knew it. So for me, it's, it's um, for my history, it's always been about discovering portions of who I am. People from Ethiopia come up to me and automatically speak to me in their language because they are like, you are a part of my, 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 my people. And to me, I'm just an African American who was born in Oklahoma. So um, it's not drowning. That's kind of the sentiment. My family has went from place to place to place, and each family has assisted one another, trying to compete in a world that, is, that pretty much kind of rejected us to some degree um, once we came from slavery. In fact, it was found out that our, our um, slave name was um, Belton. And that my um, grand great great grandfather um, changed his name to White. So it's discovering upon discovery who we are, and some of that has been um, there's the disconnect there. But being here and discovering, you know, finally putting my hands in the soil, <laughs> and kind of being a part of that has been a really great interest to continue on in that. But 
it's still always the battle of can I get this position? Can I make enough to survive in this world that's still giving us the pushback? So that's just what I want to contribute. Any other comments? Any others? Okay. Um, so I started my career as a park ranger and I uh, worked at Hard Bargain and the Park Service paid us and it was in their own thing. But <clears throat> the thing I noticed about all children, but particularly children from the city who were isolated from the environment, was that they need to do things that don't look like learning. They need to walk through tall grass and pick stick types off their clothes. They need to not be afraid of a bug. And so it's that exposure thing, and I think it's starting really early is, is the place to begin. Because once they've started playing with their gadgets and sitting in front of the TV or doing the thing that's easy, then they're not attracted. Um, and it is a fear. Um, you know, I don't have the experience of your fear of not being welcome, but I mean, I loved it when um, I was taking kids through the woods and I'd have um, black kids holding on to me for security and one in each hand and we're walking through and we're exploring. And, and I, I hate to see it, but I, we're studying this too much. We just need to let them crawl through nature, however that looks. Um, because that's what breaks the ice. I think most of us who work in that area had experiences very early in life where we were learned to be comfortable in outdoors. So. Yeah, and what the I mean, what the gentleman in the back. I'm sorry, I just yeah. jumped in. <laughs> but, but yeah, what the gentleman in the back said about you know opportunity for that access is you know it's 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 a huge part of it. It's that's part of what makes it that kind of creates that, elitism, that elitism that makes it a place where people of color feel like they can't go. Um, you know, I was lucky, you know, I was, where I grew up, I was the rich black kid because we had a car that worked all the time and I had, you know, both of my parents worked all the time and had like actual salaries and pensions coming and I had a free Game Boy, like I was, you know, I was like lifestyles of rich and famous, but I grew up with people that couldn't afford to turn their hot water games on. You know, people that heated up the bathroom on the stove. Like these guys had no way, you know, there was no car to take them to the, you know, to a nearby you know, car where you could actually you know, crawl through and talk grass and you know what you're talking about. Um, but I think you're, you know, you're right. Is that when kids have that visceral experience with nature, when you know, when they grow something, when they feel soil, when they feel how air is different, how it smells different, feels different when you're in a park versus in a city, that changes people. And I think one of the big things is going to be. You know, reaching out into those communities and bringing them in because it's so hard <coughs> for them to kind of bridge that gap. And I think, frankly, that's something that that Acti has done has done pretty well so far. And I will continue. Did you want to talk about the Hi, I'm Lindsay. Um, I work in planning and systems regionally, and I've done some work with Acti. And I read your um, Instagram feed every day, Chris. I'm so sorry. It's so <laughs> awesome. It's so amazing. I look at that following. Um, yeah, I just had kind of two anecdotal observations, and um, I'm really curious to look up this book. But I graduated from the University of Michigan um, with a master's in environmental policy in 2006, and I also did undergrad there. And I was really stunned, actually, at the lack of diversity in my master's level program. Um, I could count on less than one hand the students of color in that program. Um, and the ones that were there were generally studying with two professors of color who are just tremendous thinkers and leaders in the field of environmental justice. Um, when I moved here, one of the things that I started hearing about a lot from African American friends or people that I would meet around my age, like 40s, late 30s, um, was just these memories of going to um, their grandparents' gardens, often somewhere uh, in the southeast, south of here. And I guess I just raised that to ask, how does the book conceive of nature? Because 
I mean, to me, it seems like, no, that's not the same as hiking in a national park or a conserved area or having your own farm. But I just wonder how the book talks about and thinks about nature and how we think about nature. Well, I'm not prepared to have that for that essay question. <laughs> but I will tell you that she does define it as sort of the natural recreation as opposed to heritage kinds of things. Um, but I would recommend that you, that you do check it because she goes into all sorts of issues like slavery and Jim Crow and some of the issues that you mentioned. And whether you agree with her or not, it's food for thought. And it gets you to think about how can I, you know, what is my little role, of my, you know, in my person to, um, to move this forward. I wanted to ask um, how much time before we, uh, before you want to transition to the next? We have five minutes. Five minutes, okay. Um, well, thank you. No, that's, that's good to know. I was all worried that I had 5,000 questions to ask. Um, but then what I'm going to do is sort of sum up what I've heard and then ask you to speak to that. And um, I've heard that um, uh, we want to tell stories, or you would like to see Akiki Creek tell stories, not necessarily about Washington, not necessarily colonial stories, depending on where you sit in the landscape. Um, climate change, I heard, was of interest. Um, the one-on-one, -on -one, heard that repeatedly, this idea of the visceral experience, the one-on-one, -on -one, that you had mentioned a couple of other people, and then providing these opportunities for people um, to feel welcome. So those were some of them. I know that they're just small nuggets, but I think that they are something that we can build on, or that the Akakate Creek Foundation, Akake Foundation can build on. Um, is it, does anybody want to add something that they haven't heard brought up um, and I can't have time to go through my 4,999 remaining questions. I'm always prepared. Just one thing. Um, the difficulty of interpreting layered history is very difficult to do without some type of visual reinforcement of what it is you would like someone to learn. Um, you can talk about it intellectually all you want, but it doesn't mean that everyone is going to understand and have the same image you know, when we talk about Native Americans, people have an image of everything from John Wayne movies, which is not depicting really anything that we know about that's true, to maybe something that they know from anthropology or archaeology. Uh, and so, without some kind of visual sense of what it is that you're trying to interpret, and then if you're trying to do that on a layered, complex stage, um, I find it really difficult to figure out how, about you, how you would present that. Um, and not just in storyboards or you know, handouts, but in something that's on the landscape itself, since you're talking about the landscape. It must be sort of a demo. You just can't ask someone to look at a field and say, no, imagine the following, you know, gas stations or whatever. I mean, you need to either three-dimensionally um, somehow figure it out. And I, I'm trying to figure out how you're going to accomplish that or how you're going to approach it. Does that make sense? It does, and you know, I live in St. Mary City, and for years there was an 1840s house sitting over top of the 1640s early governor's house, and everybody thought that 1840s house was the governor's house. I mean, and finally, what they did at great expense to the state, they jacked the house up. And well, and Ben Franklin's house in Philadelphia is a great example of yeah. the tubular frame, because they don't have a picture of it, they don't have an yeah. uh, image of it, but they do know its dimensions, and so they did a Ventura, I think, was the architect in the frame of it, and you still walk away with the idea that you saw Ben Franklin's house, even though it's not. Um, so I'm just trying to figure out what you want to do in trying to layer the various things that you have here from open space before Native Americans even immigrated to this area to Native American experience to when it became um, multicultural and black, Native American, white, and the intermarriage and integration and the non-integration of those people from colonial days through statehoods and then where you go from there. And again, the idea that the Agape Foundation of the Colonial Park is really a point in time interpretation, saying that this is what the yeoman looked like to the plantation across the river. Um, it's a great question, and I think that ultimately that the Agape Foundation will have to hire professional museum designers and interpreters. But if we can get to that something that is of interest. Virginia? Um, I'd like to speak to that. Um, it goes back to not just how you're going to physically represent it, but it's people need to 
uh, be uh, open to understand that every place has a deep and complicated history. And that's like part of why it's hard to convey is that people perhaps find it hard to receive that people of places have deep histories, and that's part of like the sectioning off and these people must disappear that Chris alluded to in his opening statements of this is a blank slate and this is a history that we can understand here and these living people have to disappear because we only acknowledge them as something from the past. But if you start from a mindset that places have long deep histories and you just start from the fact that it's going to be complicated and a lot of things are going to be intervening, that that enables you to understand the multifaceted places and, and aspects of a piece of land. So there's a mindset of acknowledging the things that went there, and then there's the how are you going to physically, intellectually engage people on certain points. That's always hard, but getting them to the mindset of let's let's understand their full stories here. What makes sense? We have time for like one. I can, I can speak about it if I may. Uh, <laughs> did you want to make one? Yeah, can I make just one comment about yes. that though? Because it's kind of an important thing when you, when you talk about you know, layered history. Um, from an indigenous standpoint, one of the biggest problems we have is that we are almost always exclusively referred to as existing in the past. Um, and one of the things that, that, that frankly kind of makes me not want to do, like, let me, let me back a little bit. So when people talk about museum projects with Native people, it's, it's usually let's build longhouses, let's replicate a village from, you know, from such and such a time, and it's, it's constantly back then. And there's very little discussion about what Native culture not only exists as today, but what our ancestral knowledge from the past can be applied to, to today's problems. For example, climate change that was brought up. You know, the way that Native people did agroforestry and the way that we maintain farms and grew food and provided for ourselves in a way that was sustainable. There are lessons in there that are almost never explored um, because Native people tend to be viewed almost exclusively as museum relics. And there's an obsession with accuracy and history and making sure that we knew exactly what my, you know, what kid the monk would look like. But that matters and it's important, but it's like we, we've, we've read this book over and over and over and over again. And can we please, please start looking to the future as well as the past? As the interpretation coordinator, it's my responsibility to make sure that we are telling the stories of the people in this area respectfully and compassionately. And with the team of interpreters that I have now and the interpreters that we are looking to bring in in the very near future, we will be the faces and the voices that will show the framework so that when someone comes in and they want to know the people who are on this land, past and present and future, we will have the proper representation so that they can have a face and a voice to remember. So it's more than just words in a textbook or seeing a home and misidentifying it as someone else's home or looking at a piece of pottery and misinterpreting it or misidentifying it from a different era. And that is, that is very important to me that we tell the stories past, present, and future respectfully and honestly and the staff that I have the opportunity to work with and the team that we have, we are looking to hire the people that will tell those stories so that the community will understand and have a better knowledge base for their land. And with that, it is now. Uh, yes. Uh, I, I think uh, it, it's very useful. Let's talk about interpreting various layers. Um, and I think Chris brings up a, a very useful point, which is the layers aren't necessarily all in the past if they, if they have a connection. And it's, it's fascinating culturally, uh, just in what he said, is I, I've been brought up looking at Mount Vernon and looking at, at it as the years ago. He's been brought up to it, not looking at it, inwardly. And I think just that contrast is, uh, is a very useful point of departure. I don't think our job is to solve this thing. I think it's too. That has been solved in a huge 
the nation, whichever nation you want to talk about, hasn't solved it yet. But I think framing that the layers have a past and a future uh, and describing what they are is extremely useful. And then other people in their own minds have to, we, we're not giving them, uh, but they have to give them the, the approach that they want to Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just going to bring up, I don't know if you're working with other um, similar historic places in interpreting. I've seen some effective um, just across the way at Woodlawn. I was a writer residence there this past summer. And they brought in, so they know they had slaves. They don't know much more than first names, about uh, 90 first names. And they brought an artist to interpret each space. Um, so the dining room was taken over with African pottery. And there was art in each room just to... So like you were saying, Chris, that the accuracy came second to just introducing storylines, basically, and possible narratives, because they didn't have the history to point to. And um, I just thought that was an interesting approach. I want to say, people are sick of accurate history. <laughs> but I don't mean it that way. I, I mean like what you're saying. I would be drawn to an exhibit like that, to go to see uh, you know, something that was really different and sort of turn things upside down. And museums uh, and parks need to do things like that because we're, you know, I mean, I used to work in a museum, but we're constantly, you know, uh, struggling to get audiences, not just online, but in the door. Um, I, I just wanted to mention there was a, a, a really good article in the New York Times about a diorama they had at the Natural History Museum in New York. Um, showing indigenous people and the colonists coming and that whole Dutch story. And they had a big conversation about what to do with it. And instead of getting rid of it, paying over it or whatever, they uh, worked at um, putting interpretation on top of it. So it's like, this is the problem with this little image. This is what the re what really was happening or not happening. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's kind of the idea of layers being in conversation with each other. And that the, the, the conversation is not just about what happened, but how people interpreted what happened, both then and now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Thank you, Julian, so much for guiding this moderation, and thank you, Wilton and Chris, for your expertise and your perspective, and for everyone that's participated. <coughs> thank you very much for your participation. Uh, this has been a very enlightening discussion, and I hope that everyone has a chance to really think about the things that were that they heard today, so that they can internalize them and see how they would like to move forward. And with that, I would like to introduce Rob Forloni, who will lead our activities later this afternoon after a brief networking reception. Robert Forloni collaborates with cultural institutions to develop innovative programs, train interpreters, and facilitate strategic planning. He has worked in the field for more than 20 years as an educator, administrator, and consultant at institutions such as the Brooklyn Museum of Art, American Museum of Natural History, and the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum. He also serves as an adjunct professor at You don't have to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Rob. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. As we're saying, this was a nice transition from the panel presentations to conversations specifically about interpretation on the site. And one of the things that we're trying to do this afternoon is talk specifically about what Akaki Foundation can do here at Piscataway Park to incorporate some of the stories of the marginalized communities that haven't been represented before. So they're undergoing a comprehensive interpretive planning process right now. And through this process, we want to engage directly with the community. Rather than having this as a top-down type of situation where it's being developed internally just with the staff and then presented to the community for review, we want to develop the interpretation with the community's input from the very beginning and throughout the entire process. So we're hoping that you're going to be able to stay after the reception and have a specific conversation that's targeted about interpretation 
for the work that's going on in this process. The idea behind this is engaging people to talk about what stories should be told, be really specific about those narratives, why they're significant, help us develop themes for the work that's taking place, and then also talking more specifically about the different interpretive methodologies that we can utilize. Because the things that we started talking about in the last 10 minutes or so are exactly what we're going to be discussing after the fact. The idea is that there's lots of different ways of incorporating these stories from augmented reality showing what's going on in the landscape, incorporating exhibitions, including oral histories from the people in these communities so they're telling their stories. The idea is rather than having an institution telling the story about the community, we want the communities to be able to tell the stories for themselves. I think Chris's point is really important and the National Park Service in particular is really invested in making people understand that the American Indian communities that are here today are still thriving and vibrant and part of this. I think part of the problem that we have with interpretation from a historic content is it's very colonized in terms of putting everything into compartments and thinking of things in a linear progression. We have to break away from that in order to include all the different types of ways of thinking about the landscape. So after the reception, we're going to have a discussion specifically with you all about the stories that you think are most important, specifically about the landscape and the people's relationship between the landscape and place. As we said, there's going to be two other sessions where we talk more specifically about different communities. Today's conversation is going to be particularly about the landscape conservation efforts and the relationships of those. I know not everyone can stay, so we're hoping that if you're not able to stay for this conversation, you can leave some information. On the back, there's a couple of prompts there, and you're more than welcome if you are not comfortable speaking in front of a large group to do that in addition to that. And then we're going to have multiple vehicles for getting input from you in addition to this, going on SurveyMonkey or some similar tools online. So the main idea is we're trying to collect as much input from people as we possibly can when we start to think through this process about how we can change interpretation to be more representative and inclusive of the communities that are here today and that we're here in the deep past going forward. So thank you all, and I think we're going to go on to the reception. Shamika or Laura, you want to introduce that one? Yes, thank you very much. Um, before we break for the reception, you were all handed out surveys. If you could please ensure that those are filled out and then laid right on that corner table. Um, right when you are done so that we can have the feedback from those from everyone here. Um, I'd also like to take this time to thank my fellow Akakik staff members for all of your help and support and a special thank you to Mary Alice and Casey for coming in and setting up the education building today and making it look so lovely. Um, if you cannot stay for the public scoping after the reception, we hope that you keep in mind to join us for part two and part three of our work so workshop sessions. Uh, Sunday, April 28th, will be Reciprocity, Humans, and the Environment. And Sunday, May 5th, will be Interconnectedness, Heritage, Traditions, and History. So we will now have the reception in the foyer. We hope that you can stay, but if you cannot, please join us back on April 28th and May 5th. Thank you.